So good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Fidelli from First Five Marin, and this is the Marin Communications Forum. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn more about promoting social emotional development in young children. And we are very pleased to have with us uh, as our presenter today, Kara Dukakis from Too Small to Fail. And I'll let her do her self introduction. She has a, an illustrious bio and I'll let you share as you like. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's really wonderful to be with here with you here today. Um, I am really honored to have this opportunity, and um, I have to say I'm I'm impressed and a little daunted by all of you here in the room today um, and the sort of breadth of experience that you have uh, from early childhood to early mental health to um, to a number of other uh, to education to a number of other fields. Um, I uh, am going to spend uh, a fair amount of time today, or at least the beginning of my presentation, talking about what Too Small to Fail is, um, so that you have the context to understand sort of how we came to incorporate uh, social emotional development into Too Small to Fail and into the work that, that we've done. Um, I also feel like I should uh, make a little bit of a disclaimer that um, Many of you have uh, experience beyond my own um, in the various fields that you have, um, but with Too Small to Fail, and I'll explain this in a moment, um, we take a very specific approach to the work that we do uh, that involves a lot of strategic communications, and so I'd like to tell you the story a little bit of, of how we came to incorporate, as I said, social emotional development. Uh, first, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of background on myself. I've been with Too Small to Fail for about three years um, and as the director. Uh, Too Small to Fail is a joint initiative between the Clinton Foundation and a nonprofit based in Berkeley called the Opportunity Institute, uh, which is where I work. Uh, before that time, I was at Stanford University for six years doing research on youth development, including early childhood. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, the chair of the First Five San Francisco Commission and uh, worked at Children Now uh, doing policy work on early childhood development uh, at a time when we were really pushing universal preschool uh, through legislation, but also through a ballot initiative, which as many of you may remember, ultimately did not come to fruition, though uh, some really incredible things have happened at the local level since then. And then um, further back, um, but a very, very important part of my career um, is that I, I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I worked for many years for the San Francisco Department of Mental Health, Family and Children's Services in a program called the Foster Care Mental Health Program. And I worked directly with uh, children, birth parents, foster parents, and many, many child welfare workers, specifically on delivering mental health services to children in the dependency system. Um, and much of my uh, interest in this area and the design of the work that we've done in social emotional development is in, informed by my background and, and really my identity as, as a social worker. Okay, without further ado, um, so too small to fail. Uh, I mentioned it's a joint initiative between the Clinton Foundation and the Opportunity Institute. Uh, we've been around for about four years. Um, and the very, at the very beginning, when um, it was actually Secretary Clinton who was very interested uh, and has a lifelong commitment to early childhood development, um, and we were talking about engaging in work that would benefit and improve the outcomes of children zero to five and their families. We met with a small group of advisors, experts on early childhood development, um, and influentials in the field, and asked them about where they thought we should really focus and double down. Um, and they said a couple of things to us. They said, first of all, that it was incredibly important that we had a real 
really strong research base, um, which no surprise to anybody here, there's a very strong research base broadly for early childhood development and quality early childhood development. But that second of all, we really needed to narrow our focus and we really needed to work on something um, that was tangible and, and, and really hopefully achievable um, over a period of time. Um, and so, what we settled on um, and what the sort of base of the campaign is, is, is that it is a, a public awareness and action campaign focused on improving outcomes for zero to five year olds, but specifically focused on helping parents and caregivers to understand the critical role they play in their children's brain development. And uh, in doing that, in increasing their awareness and their uh, attitudes and their understanding, uh, increasing the number of meaningful interactions and the quality of the, those meaningful interactions between parents and caregivers and young children zero to five. Because we also know from the research that um, there are literally, now it's estimated, billions of neural connections that are made every second inside the brain of a newborn child um, and between when they're born and when they turn three. Um, so, so that was part of uh, sort of the impetus for this. In addition to the now incredibly um, broad and growing research base on the neural connections that are made and on the fact that um, brain growth is most rapid in the early or first three years of life. There's also a lot of research that I'm sure you're familiar with on um, what's known as the word gap, that um, children from lower income families uh, hear uh, on average about 30 million fewer words than children from higher income families by the age of four, and that that translates directly um, into a gap in words learned uh, by the age of three uh, that is significant, uh, several, several thousands of words. That we have taken to heart um, and used that research a lot, but I also just wanna pause and say that we've kind of amended that over time because we feel like even though it is compelling that there is a gap, what's more compelling to us is that the interactions, the quality of the interactions and the number of words that parents and caregivers use in interacting with young children, um, the fact that they are back and forth, that they're engaged, that they include eye contact, that they really are high quality is just as important as the number of words that, um, that children are hearing um, and that parents are, and caregivers are using to interact with them. So that was another incredibly critical piece, the word gap, but also a shift in sort of our focus on uh, not a gap and not a deficit sort of orientation, um, but more what can be done and the power of what can be done. And then the third piece of research, um, other than, than those neural connections, um, other than the, the word gap and also the incredible power of meaningful engagement, the third piece of evidence um, that we used was informed by the growing field now of what's called behavioral economics. And the idea that these sort of small, what are called behavioral nudges, um, no matter what sort of the issue is, um, can really help to shift behavior over time. Um, and by behavioral nudges, um, our translation was trying to make small moments and uh, routine activities during the lives of young children and their parents taking those small moments and making them big. So using everyday routines like giving a bath or changing a diaper or doing laundry uh, and matching socks, um, singing a song while strolling to the bus stop, all of those things are opportunities 
for parents and caregivers to really engage in the kind of quality interactions that I was talking about before. And we have a number of different examples um, of the fact that these behavioral nudges and behavioral economics has been successful. One obviously very relevant to this body of work is the Back to Sleep campaign, um, where uh, parents and caregivers were encouraged to um, put children um, to sleep on their backs, um, and it had a dramatic, dramatic effect on lowering the incidence of SIDS. Another um, is obviously, as we know, smoking cessation. Um, that's a little bit different because you're trying to stop doing something as opposed to engage more and more in something. Um, but yet another is just, you know, Kaiser Permanente had a public awareness and action campaign focused on taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator. Those kinds of things all informed the work that we engaged in. So all of that is to say that our focus, again, is really on working specifically with parents and caregivers as our target audience and encouraging them to understand the critical role they play in their children's early brain development um, and to actually build on the behaviors that we already know they're engaging in, like talking and reading and singing during their everyday routines in order to very dramatically influence the outcomes that their young children have. So uh, that's kind of the, the big overview of Too Small to Fail and sort of how we landed where we did um, on this particular issue. I wanted to situate us a little bit in the context of a broader ecosystem. And this is not, this is for the social workers in the room, I think we all know about um, ecosystems um, and the individual at the center. This really uh, I illustration is just an opportunity for folks to see sort of how we believe we fit in um, to what exists out there. Um, there's obviously a, a, a sort of focus on policy and advocacy work. I'm going to address that a little bit later. Um, we focus less on that, but we obviously know that policy and advocacy um, produce sort of the larger systemic changes that are necessary to support the parents and caregivers who we focus on. Um, research, I've already mentioned before, is critical to informing our work, both in terms of the broader research that I mentioned, but also our own evaluation um, of our effectiveness in what we're doing. Um, direct services and clinical practice is, again, an enormous part of um, work directly with parents and caregivers um, and with children themselves, obviously, um, whether it's in social emotional development or in uh, child care or in parent engagement. Um, and we are, again, a, a public awareness and action campaign. We believe that all of these elements working together um, can really drastically sort of increase uh, children's positive outcomes uh, in life. The, the role of public awareness and action is, as I said, raising awareness, a shifting attitudes, um, and ultimately, much more, it's much more difficult to do this, but sort of increasing behaviors that we know that parents are already engaging in. So our local campaign um, is, is called Talking is Teaching, Talk, Read, Sing. And um, I think many of you here know that First Five California has a campaign called Talk, Read, Sing. And there's a long and not that interesting story that I'm not going to bother you with um, about sort of the fact that we have similar names. Um, what I will say is that our campaign is national. Obviously, First Five California's campaign is statewide. But we are very much aligned in the messages um, and in the hopes for outcomes for parents and caregivers of zero to five-year-olds. I wanted to take a couple of seconds to talk to you about Talking is Teaching, Talk, Read, Sing, um, and, and our specific campaign approach. So we, we like to divide it into sort of three different sections. Um, one is what we call an air game. Another is what we call the ground game. Um, depending on your orientation, it could be a military analogy or a football analogy. Um, but basically, our air game is uh, focused on 
parents and caregivers across the country. Um, and it's mainly achieved through media partnerships. So we partner with showrunners and directors and writers in Hollywood uh, who uh, do primetime programming to do story integrations about the importance of talking, reading, and singing and early meaningful engagement uh, in the lives of zero to five-year-olds. Um, and we've had integrations on shows like Orange is the New Black. Um, we have an integration that's gonna be coming up in the next several months on This Is Us. Um, we've worked with Jane the Virgin. Um, there are a number of different shows that have done these. And the, again, the idea is that parents who are, are watching these shows and providers who are watching these shows see the behavior modeled and hear the information about it in that way. Similarly, we have a very long-standing and um, multi-platform partnership with Univision to reach Hispanic families um, and, and Spanish-speaking Hispanic families in particular. Um, one thing we heard when we did focus groups with families early on in our process um, that we heard from Hispanic, Spanish-speaking families was that uh, Univision was one of their most trusted messengers of information uh, about the health and well-being of their young children. And so we've really taken that to heart um, and work with them on developing PSAs with their television personalities and their news anchors um, and their talk show hosts about the importance of early literacy and early numeracy and early social emotional development and the importance of bilingualism um, and speaking uh, and, and engaging with young children in the language in which a parent is most comfortable with. Um, we also have a texting program uh, that we uh, uh, make available to, to Univision viewers um, that sort of cross-promoted uh, through television programs. And then more recently, um, we've actually developed a telenovela um, that is actually gonna be airing on the Sunday before Labor Day called La Fuerza de Creer, uh, which takes place in a public health clinic and um, includes a whole lot of storylines about parents and caregivers and young children and the importance of uh, early intervention and early engagement. Um, and then we, we also have a partnership with Spotify um, to do playlists on the sing part of Talking is Teaching, Talk, Read, Sing, where we have television personalities um, provide bits of, of information in between playlists for the car, for the bath, for changing a diaper. Again, all of those are part of our, our air game uh, strategy. The ground game, which is um, really what uh, my colleague Meredith Dorkin and I, uh, who's here, focus on, has to do with our work in communities. Um, and there are three main com components to that work in communities. One is uh, the use of trusted messengers, whether they're pediatricians in clinics or children's hospitals, uh, faith-based leaders in churches um, and other places of worship, uh, librarians, um, definitely childcare providers and preschool teachers teachers, all of those folks are people that, again, when we did focus groups with parents early on, parents trust for information about the health and well-being of their young children. And so we work with those trusted messengers in community-based institutions um, and in specific communities to inform and engage parents in the kind of behavior and um, the knowledge building that, uh, that I talked about earlier. We also, as part of the ground campaign, have messages in community spaces. Um, so we have messages uh, on panels and playgrounds where young children go. We have a partnership with diaper banks across the country to deliver uh, books and, and materials. Um, we uh, have a whole set of materials for grocery stores to encourage engage engagement between parents and caregivers. And then we have posters in bus shelters um, and on billboards. And the idea is that these environmental prompts sort of uh, reinforce the behaviors that the trusted messengers are, are delivering on the ground. And then finally, we've developed a number of different tools, some of which I'm going to share with you today, um, on both the importance of um, early meaningful engagement, um, but also uh, on ways to do it, um, from videos to uh, tip sheets to uh, a number of other um, materials that I'll talk about. 
And then finally, we work with national organizations, kind of at the nexus of the air game and the ground game. We work with national organizations that mostly have membership uh, chapters. So um, we uh, work with a, a international playground developer uh, who has uh, developed panels with our uh, material, with our creative designs, um, and placed them in over 40 playgrounds across the country now. Um, we are in partnership with the National WIC Association um, and uh, New Technology, a piece of what they do called WIC Shopper that we're going to be integrating our content into, um, and the National Diaper Bank Network I mentioned before, soon to be the Girl Scouts who are going to help us build tiny libraries to place in neighborhoods. So the idea is that these are national organizations with local chapters. Okay, so our story really of um, the content areas that we focus on, I've, I've already started. Um, it, it started very much, overall it has to do with early brain development, but we started really with early literacy, with using the research from Hart and Risley on the word gap, on the importance of meaningful early engagement starting from birth between parents and caregivers and their young children. Um, that's really the, the base of, of where we started and, um, and our, our focus. Um, we then expanded into early math and early STEM because we saw, again, based on research, that there was an enormous amount of very compelling uh, evidence that shows that uh, early math, early numeracy, um, and early STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, um, has a pretty profound effect on the overall outcomes of children in school and beyond. Um, and in fact, early math skills uh, are a better predictor of uh, reading skills later than they are of math skills later. So there was a, a very um, intentional uh, sort of decision on our part to move early math and early STEM into our campaign. Um, under the sort of general communications uh, approach of engagement, talking, reading, and singing, this time about math, and in terms of STEM, this time about sort of exploration, asking questions, asking why, you know, creating hypotheses and pursuing those along. Um, and then, once we had a very solid basis in early literacy um, and early STEM and math, we actually, it, it predated this. We had always known that social emotional development is really at the core of children's outcomes um, in terms of their later development. That it's about the relationships. It's about the social part and it's about the emotional awareness um, and the emotional connection that young children have with their parents and caregivers. Starting with bonding and attachment, obviously, um, with parent emotional availability, with things like co-regulation, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, but the most important thing here is that this diagram sort of implies that these uh, these uh, domains are separate, and they 100% are not, as I think most people in this room know. They are all totally interdependent and interconnected. And um, development in one of these domains um, has a, an enormous effect on development in the others and vice versa. So while it may look here like we are separating them out, out, really um, what we want to get across is that they're all interconnected, they're all mutually reinforcing, and you really need sort of all of them and the body of them uh, in order to uh, promote uh, sort of positive outcomes for young children uh, and their families. And, um, and that's uh, sort of the, the perspective we have taken thus far. Okay, so I am going to um, move along to, to social emotional development. Um, I, I guess I, one other thing I wanna say is that, um, you know, talking is teaching, talk, read, sing is something that 
folks really embraced because it's it's tangible, it's clear, it's simple, um, and it, it makes sense. Um, social emotional development, I think most people know um, instinctively is incredibly important and critical, especially you know in the earliest years um, in terms of, of bonding and attachment. But it's much harder to convey and communicate to, uh, to audiences. It's much more abstract, it's much less tangible in a sense. Um, and really, you know, what we, one of the things we're trying to do with social emotional development is to say, uh, this is the how of talking is teaching, talk, read, sing. Do it in an engaging, in a nurturing, in a meaningful, in a responsive way. Um, it's, the, it's the quality piece of it. But the other piece of what we wanted to try to convey is that talking is teaching, uh, t t talking and reading and singing in an engaging way are joyful and wonderful and promote positive development. But there are also really serious challenges that parents face. Um, you know, whether they are in the area of adversity and um, toxic stress, or they're just challenges because parenting um, and caregiving is so incredibly difficult at times, as joyful as it can be. And we felt that it was important to shine a light on that and to acknowledge it. Um, and to make it sort of an active part of uh, this meaningful engagement. Um, and so I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a moment. So overall, I've given sort of the background of how we got here. What I'm hoping to do today is first to de define, just have like a definition of social emotional development for all of us um, today based on how we've defined it at, at Too Small to Fail. Um, to talk some about the research, again, I think many people know about it. Um, to share the key messages that we have focused on through Talking is Teaching and Too Small to Fail, um, and the strategies that we have chosen to focus on. Um, to talk a, a bit about policy considerations, because um, social emotional development in the sort of like policy area is getting a lot more attention uh, than it has before. It certainly is at the K-12 level, um, and it's there is somewhat, I think, of an irony about the K-12 12 level kind of finally coming along um, with this and social emotional development and zero to five year olds having been something very critical but that we keep having to sort of reinforce and, and focus on. And then I'd love to, um, to hear your questions. So um, again, in our process of developing social emotional development tools, um, we uh, did a number of different things. We um, did an exhaustive review of both the research out there and the tools out there. Um, and there's a lot out there and there's a lot of incredible stuff out there, but it um, it's, can be overwhelming for parents and caregivers to look at all of it. Um, we had an initial convening a little over a year ago of um, national practitioners and clinicians, of researchers, um, and of also, also of communications experts, because really that's what, what we are focusing on, how we best communicate these notions through trusted messengers and through our materials. We uh, did a collaboration with an organization called the Frameworks Institute that does a lot of really smart um, and really well thought out and well researched communications, uh, messaging uh, around a variety of issues, including early childhood development. Um, they led a creative design session to sort of generate and brainstorm different sort of special topics based on research in social emotional development among zero to five year olds. Um, they also uh, conducted a series of focus groups with uh, low income parents of zero to five year olds and caregivers as well. We engaged in a partnership with the federal departments of health and human services and education um, and developed a series of tools 
with them, um, and it was with them that we developed sort of our definitions of social emotional development. Um, and then we developed some products, uh, which I'm gonna share with you today. Um, a white paper on the evidence base because we felt that um, sort of moving somewhat to shine a light on social emotional development, we really needed to establish that evidence base. Um, tip sheets because we heard that through research that parents were really looking for and caregivers were really looking for um, sort of clear, accessible, comprehensive resources. And as part of those resources, a series of videos. And I'll talk a little bit about why we decided to go in the direction of, of videos um, to, to emphasize those. So this definition is not all-encompassing um, that we came up with. Uh, we really set out to um, create something or create a definition that, was, that you could wrap your hands around and understand that didn't feel jargony, um, but I will say as a disclaimer, is not totally and completely all-encompassing. Um, it, uh, it, we think, contains many of the critical elements. So it's really about creating relationships um, between children and their peers and adults, learning to identify their feelings and understand the feelings of others, whether, again, their peers or adults, um, and, and to uh, sort of internalize that and act on that. And, then the final piece is about managing their behavior. Um, we say controlling their behavior, managing their behavior may be the, the better piece of it, but it all sort of um, is under the, the area of self-regulation, which as people know is encompassed by the area of, of executive functioning. So this is a highly simplified definition, but one that we really felt um, folks could could understand and, um, and appreciate and, and wasn't overly complicated. And then we broke it down. Um, and you know, part of the reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you today is to, to share sort of our process, but it's also so that we're all kind of on the same page in terms of what we mean by, by social emotional development. Um, I think most of these are somewhat self-explanatory. Um, social interaction, again, it's all about the relationships. Um, I've heard that and I believe that sort of to my core, that it really has to do with strong, healthy, positive, responsive, engaging relationships, um, particularly with caregivers and children, but also with caregivers, um, with children and their peers. Um, this you know, obviously uh, kind of social development allows children to do things like taking turns, helping their friends, playing together, cooperating, those kinds of activities. Um, emotional and awareness, again, I, you know, I talked about it a moment ago. Um, th this is, I think, slightly more nuanced and maybe slightly more abstract than, than the social um, aspect of social emotional development, but, you know, how can we support children to recognize and understand their feelings and emotions and those of others and their actions that are influenced by their feelings and emotions and the actions of others that are influenced by feelings and emotions? Um, and to sort of understand that there is an effect of our feelings and emotions on our actions um, that influences our interactions with other people and uh, peers or adults. Um, Self-regulation, I mentioned before, it is one aspect of executive functioning, which is a, a much broader concept that is part of social emotional development. Um, but it's uh, about you know how children can express themselves in what or is considered socially appropriate ways, and I realize that that can differ broadly across cultures, across, uh, across abilities, um, and those are things that um, we uh, have talked about and have um, used, research on, used the research on to sort of inform our, our work. Um, and then finally, this notion of co-regulation, um, which to us, because our focus is on parents and caregivers uh, primarily, um, and then in the longer term on children, this notion of um, 
uh, an interactive process between children, whether they're infants or you know up to five or older, and their parents and caregivers, and how that interactive process sort of is reciprocal, and um, the reaction, the actions of the child affect the reactions of the parent or caregiver, um, and vice versa, uh, is I think incredibly important to the healthy social emotional development of young children, um, because we know that parents who or caregivers who are, you know, highly responsive, highly engaging, um, and uh, are, uh, are sort of present and emotionally available for their children really shapes who that child is, that child's level of sort of security, secure attachment, willingness to go and explore the world, um, and vice versa. Um, and so parents' ability to uh, engage in those activities but also manage their own um, reactions to their children's feelings and behaviors uh, is another area that we really wanted to focus in on um, in terms of our work because um, we have felt that a lot of times um, when we're talking about social emotional development it is sort of entirely focused on the child which of course is very important but the child's social emotional development is entirely dependent on that of their parent and caregiver. And so it's critical for parents and caregivers to feel that they are uh, experiencing uh, healthy social emotional development um, and they understand how that affects and impacts their children and the children in their care. In terms of the research, um, there is an enormous amount of research that um, we have in the white paper that, that we published that um, I hope you will take a look at. Um, not any huge surprises probably for this crowd. Um, you know, first of all, relationships are at the core. Um, second, that there is a very direct uh, influence and effect of healthy social emotional development on um, learning and on academic performance, um, and uh, that has been documented in longitudinal studies now, um, and uh, it is uh, very important, I think, in terms of developing policy, um, is particularly for people who focus a lot on sort of academic outcomes and you know we live in a, a, a world where academics and school performance and um, and uh, that is incredibly important um, we also know that positive social emotional development is um, particularly important for children from low-income backgrounds um, and kids who have um, special needs or developmental delays, um, that it is for a wide, wide, wide variety of reasons um, incredibly uh, important for, for kids with, with those kinds of backgrounds. And then we also know, and this is where really social emotional development and the early literacy and early STEM and math work comes in, we know that the kind of caregiving, the kind of responsive and nurturing um, caregiving paired with the sort of activities um, that involve uh, engagement with talking and reading and singing um, really can strengthen those bonds and outcomes. So affection is important, but if we can pair those meaningful interactions with responsive and nurturing caregiving, that's really where um, the, the, the progress can be pushed even further. So I wanted to share, um, in addition to that, uh, some really interesting research that um, is on social emotional development milestones and also expectations um, of, of parents. And this came out of a zero to three, which you're probably familiar with. Um, and let me start by saying they, they did a national parent survey. Um, and then they also did uh, a number of focus groups with parents, uh, again, nationally, all over the country. Let me say, first and foremost, the research showed that parents believe that parenting and engaging with their children is a joyful experience um, that uh, gives them much personal joy, that they can, where they can see joy in their children, um, and that they absolutely want to uh, increase and continue that joyful engagement. Um, 
the research also showed something very interesting, um, which is that there was somewhat of a mismatch in parents' understanding and their expectations of their child's social emotional development. And this, this happened in a couple of ways. So on the emotional side, um, parents overwhelmingly believed that their children developed much more slowly than they actually do. That in other words, that young children are emotionally capable of less than they actually are at certain ages. And on the social side, parents and caregivers expected much more from their children, that their, that their children were capable of, of, um, of behaving in ways and interacting with other kids and adults that were much more advanced than we know based on research um, and uh, psychology um, and, and developmental phases that children actually were. So for, for example, although babies experience emotions like sadness and fear as early as, as three months or even before, um, this survey found that the majority of parents thought their children did not experience those emotions until six months or older. So that was one big, I think, reveal. Um, and then, again, in the same survey, about half of all parents uh, had uh, an underestimation of how early their infants were able to pick up on the intentions and feelings of others. So 47% believed that one-year-old children are not affected by parents' moods. Um, when we know that that is not the case, um, despite the, the fact, oh, my battery is running low. Um, let me grab, sorry about that. So, I know that was a cliffhanger there. <laughs> um, but uh, so they, they believe that one-year-old children were not affected by, by their parents' moods, um, even though we know that um, evidence uh, shows that this capacity emerges about three months of age. Um, and then parents uh, believed, or at least one quarter of parents believed that they think parents, that children's ability to um, to control their emotions uh, develops at three or four years of age. Uh, I, I'm sorry, we know that, that children can control their emotions about, at about three or four years of age, but about one quarter of parents thought that this occurred at one year of age or younger. So again, a mismatch in parents' kind of expectations um, and understanding of what their children are develop, ble, developmentally capable of um, at different ages. So there was sort of um, an, an underestimation of what they thought children fe felt and an overestimation of what they felt children were capable of uh, socially. Um, so anyway, those were some actually very, uh, I think, compelling uh, and revealing findings from that research that was conducted by, by Zero to Three that definitely influenced our, um, our work in this area. Um, I'm assuming that we're... Okay, great. I'm just gonna keep going. Um, apologies about this. Um, so we developed a white paper, and the white paper in many ways uh, reflected much of what we found in the research. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the importance of boosting, a of social emotional development, boosting academic development um, and academic achievement, um, that there are disparities, disparities in social emotional development between lower and higher income children. Um, 
the incredibly important and powerful role of stable, nurturing, and responsive caregiving uh, paired with um, interaction, meaningful interaction between parents and young children. But then also that parents have, have said over and over again that they, they need information about these kinds of issues from a trusted source. Um, and that was heartening to us because of our work um, on trusted messengers. Um, and in addition to that, that existing interventions, often there is a tension between really strong interventions, whether it's through nurse family partnerships or um, mental health consultation or um, sort of dyadic infant parent psychotherapy. Um, and being able to scale those interventions, um, which brings about a policy issue. And um, how do we manage the fact that there are some really strong evidence-based inter interventions um, that are costly? Uh, and how do we sort of uh, expand on what we know is working um, and apply it elsewhere when it is so expensive? So those were things that, that came out in our um, in our <laughs> research. <laughs> um, thank you. So um, the other piece that I did want to just uh, share is that we found in doing our research that um, th there has been a lot in the area of social emotional development, and I know all of you know this as well, if not better than I do, there, there is an a incredibly critical piece of social emotional development that focuses on adversity and toxic stress. And my understanding is that um, many people in this room know a lot about adversity and toxic stress, um, how incredibly um, intense it can be, uh, and... Is it, is, we're still waiting. Okay. Thank you. Is my laptop out? Okay. There you go. I apologize for the technical difficulties, everyone. And thank you for your patience. Um, so we, what we were hearing a fair amount, um, and this is you know not necessarily from experts on social emotional development, but it, it seemed that there was somewhat of a um, okay. Now you're going to see me go through my entire process of. Um, yay! Okay. Um, so, so what we were hearing from a number of people is that there was a little bit of a conflation between social emotional development, um, adversity, and toxic stress. That when when folks talked about social emotional development, they said, "Oh, you mean you mean adversity, or you mean ACEs, or you mean toxic stress?" Which, again, I think many people in this room realize um, is is not accurate um, and is not the case at all. But we did feel that it was really important to sort of define clearly the difference between social emotional development, what we meant by social emotional development, what we mean by adversity and adverse childhood experiences, and what we mean by toxic stress. Um, and again, without going into a whole lot of depth on definitions, um, I think the biggest takeaway for us, and we developed a sort of what we hope is a, a very easily accessible one pager on this, is that you know, social and emotional development is all encompassing. Uh, ACEs and toxic stress are a, a pieces of it, but not all of it. And that healthy social emotional development acts as a buffer for adversity and for toxic stress, even to the point of being able to reverse the effects of adversary, adversity and toxic stress. So all of the information that, um, that I've been talking about, all of the definitions, um, and especially those relationships, those critical, meaningful early relationships act as buffers and, and can actually reverse 
toxic stress. Um, the other thing that we felt was important was that uh, just because there is adversity in a child or a family's life does not mean that that automatically sort of shifts into toxic stress, that um, it involves a, a collection of adverse childhood experiences that then produce um, a biological reaction, um, which is what defines toxic stress. All right. So to the tools. So what we decided was we, we've de we developed with um, the department, federal departments of education and health and human services um, a number of tip sheets for parents and providers that were sort of developmentally appropriate um, based on developmental phases and some focused on providers and some focused on, on parents and broke down sort of social emotional development uh, in a number of different, different areas for that purpose. But what we decided um, to go beyond that was that through our work with the Frameworks Institute, we really wanted to zero in on specific issues that we could, again, raise up in terms of what we were hearing about what parents needed um, and, and also what parents wanted in terms of the kinds of issues. So rather than do something totally, we did something general and then we decided to, to do a deep dive. So the three, based on our parent um, focus groups and based on our uh, consultation with experts, Joshua Sparrow from the Brazelden Touchpoints Institute has been a long-standing advisor of ours, but there are many others in the process. We sort of came up with three main messages. Um, the first is there is a feeling behind every child behavior. Um, and I can go into a little bit more detail beyond that. It may sound simple, but um, the number of times I think that parents and caregivers struggle with that notion um, is quite, quite frequent. Um, and that being able to peel away what's actually going on on the surface for a child um, can bring great sort of enlightenment and empathy to, to a parent or a caregiver. The second is that parenting is a process, um, and sometimes I call this growth mindset parenting, if you know anything about um, the sort of uh, literature behind and research behind growth mindset, it's, it's really that, um, that learning is a process and that we learn as much from our challenges as we do from our successes. Um, and that is uh, really critical for parents in terms of being able to forgive themselves when they face a challenge and they may not manage it or respond to it as positively or as correctly as they might. And then the third is setting limits with love. And again, this one is um, a little bit, I think, more well known and practiced um, by the field, but it really is the idea that Expressing love and security um, and setting limits are not mutually exclusive. That those two things can go together um, and much of it involves a parent being able to sort of regulate themselves in the process of setting limits and also knowing that setting limits is a way of expressing love. But the way parents and caregivers can do that um, can be something that brings together, you know, firm limits and clear messages, but also sort of warmth. So anyway, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because I, I want to leave some time for questions. But um, I, I mentioned before, behind every child behavior, there is a feeling, um, and or there is a feeling behind every child behavior. Um, what we encourage parents to do in in this case is really to try to stop if there is a situation going on where there is an undesirable behavior, <laughs> to pay attention to what is going on sort of internally, to try to be sort of conscious and mindful of what is happening internally for the parent at that moment. Um, there's a lot about taking deep breaths. I think that's as much about physically sort of calming themselves as it is about realizing that you know something's happening there is something going on that this behavior which may be causing the parent embarrassment which may, may be causing the parent frustration which may be causing the parent stress there's something happening for their child and that is very challenging to do but i think 
when that process, when parents can get closer and closer to the process of discovery there, um, that can really change that, those interactions um, and that process of co-regulation between parents and young children. So one thing we say to parents um, in our tip sheets is to be a feelings detective, to almost the, the minute something is, a behavior is happening, to say what could be going on and act like they are actually investigating in some ways what's happening on the feelings level as opposed to the behavior level. Um, be kind to yourself. I mean, again, that is one thing where I think um, parents, and we learn this from the zero to three research, tend to really be very critical to themselves and of themselves um, in terms of how they, they react to the behavior um, and to be sort of gentle with themselves. And in many ways that can translate into being sort of gentle with their children as well. Um, and then the notion of building a toolbox and really coming up with concrete um, ideas. And we talk about these concrete ideas um, with the child, um, if that's possible in their development, to manage these kinds of situations. Manage your, managing your own reaction as a parent and what are those tools, but also having the child manage, manage their reaction. Okay. Um, not, oh, okay, sorry. So we developed a video along with a tip sheet. And one thing we wanted to do with videos, I mean, we felt like videos were an incredibly important part of um, expressing and uh, sharing a somewhat complex and abstract notion of social emotional development. So with this one, and that it's specifically to sort of peel back the, the onion, what is going on um, for, for the child when they react behaviorally to something. We tried something a little different, and we decided that instead of having um, it be somewhat academic, um, or which I think can be incredibly important, we wanted to do something that maybe was a little bit funny, um, but that got to our point uh, as well as we could. And we wanted to appeal to parents um, and push it out on social media, which is what, what we've done. Um, and we've gotten a really tremendous response. So um, here we go. Small children have big feelings. Our children's behavior may seem like it comes from nowhere, but there's more to it than we think. Go to talkingisteaching.org slash big feelings to discover more about what drives your child's behavior. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's an, thank you. That, that's an example of um, a way that we were trying to appeal to parents um, that would 
in a moment, um, if they're uh, in the playground, if they're in the grocery store and their kid has meltdown, um, that to, to, what we purposely did was try to sort of exaggerate, obviously, what the child was experiencing um, in order to help the parent kind of get inside um, the emotional state of the child um, and their reaction. So that's, um, that's one of the videos that, that we did. The second notion, um, or the second topic uh, that we focused on was parenting as a process, and I mentioned this before. Uh, the idea really is about uh, learning as much from the challenges uh, that you face and um, the challenges and maybe things that you don't do right all the time as a parent, as much from that as you do from the things that you do do right. Um, and that you're constantly building on your skill set as a parent. Nobody is, is born uh, knowing how to parent. Uh, and so the idea and having this mindset that you're constantly sort of building it as a muscle or, um, you know, there are other terminolo there's other terminology that, that growth mindset uh, has looked at is really important. And it's particularly important so that parents can have self-compassion, that they don't expect so much from themselves that when they do struggle, um, they... <laughs> they do struggle, then they, um, they end up beating up on themselves for, which is a lot of what, again, we learned from the zero to three research. Um, so things like following your child's lead, um, really being in touch with your own childhood and what that experience was, the notion of stopping, thinking back on what you've done, um, and then playing or stopping thinking back on what your child has done and sort of replaying it back and being reflective in that way. And then finally, you all may know um, the uh, psychologist, the brilliant psychologist, Ed Tronick. Um, he uh, had a, a quote that said, it's not the rupture, it's the repair. Um, I think a apt translation for parents is, it's not what I did, it's what I do next. Um, so uh, that's sort of the idea that you can always improve, you can always sort of repair, and that's really what that process is all about. So um, we have another somewhat more uh, traditional documentary style uh, video that we did um, featuring a, a mom actually um, on the East Coast in, in New York. And this is just a clip from it. ¿Cómo lo hago? Es, es, es así. Pero en vez de tres bolas, hay cinco. El caos es frustrante cuando tú estás en el medio del trabajo, de cocinar o de lavar. Y aceptar que hay cosas que uno no puede controlar, como cuando lloran. Listen to me, listen to me. You need to stop. You listen to me? Caminar. Fuera de, de la habitación, del lugar donde ellas están caóticamente y encerrarse cinco minutos y respirar y decir esto es temporal. Los niños son un reflejo de lo que uno es. Si estás enojado, si estás triste, si estás feliz. Hay que hablarle y repetir y repetir y repetir y nunca tirar la toalla. ¿sí? Obedient. Are you being obedient, Lorraine? Yes. Are you sure? Do you know what obedient is? Yes. What's obedient? I don't know. Sometimes you overreact at the moment. And accepting that and kind of thinking about it um, to make sure you don't repeat it. Si en algún momento yo sobre reaccioné, si todo todo el mundo lo ha hecho, los niños te sacan de tus casillas y tal vez le gritan, si. Lo primero que debo hacer es aceptar que sí, que estaba mal y pedirle disculpa a, al niño de decirlo. Dejarlo ser, saber que no todo lo que tú quieres pasa en el momento en que pasa y como tú pasas. Hay gente que piensa que con solo darle de comer, bañarlos, atenderlos es suficiente. Hay veces que uno necesita escuchar la palabra te quiero, te quiero hijo, te quiero. Especialmente después de un regaño, no importa que tan mal te portes, yo siempre te voy a querer. Y el amor es disciplina.
Okay, um, and uh, the last one, um, which obviously these are all interrelated as well. I mentioned that all of the domains that we focused on are interrelated. Um, these are interrelated as well. Um, setting limits with love um, and again, sort of love and affection um, and setting limits are not mutually exclusive. Nero Lisa just said, you know, Love is discipline in a way, um, and being able to balance those two things um, when you're setting limits without sort of attacking kind of who the child is or the character of the child, um, as opposed to really focusing on the behavior can make a big, big difference um, in terms of how the child hears and internalizes uh, that message. Um, obviously, modeling positive behavior is huge. Uh, kids pick up on every small thing that, <laughs> that parents do, uh, positive and negative. <laughs> Um, okay, and then just before I wrap up, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the broader context and policy considerations, which is not our focus necessarily at Too Small to Fail, but um, it is something that I think is, is critical to this sort of subject of social emotional development um, becoming uh, something that sort of systemically can uh, be supported um, by public policies and, and legislation. Um, so uh, these, uh, I should say, I did not come up with these myself, and much of the content of what I've shared with you, um, we did in collaboration with others. Um, this is from the spring edition, the 20, spring 2017 edition from the Future of Children. Um, and so a big, big piece of what I think on the policy level um, is, is challenging about social emotional development is there's no kind of standardized way to assess it. Um, and this gets to the fact that like it's an abstract topic, it's, you know, it's not like, um, it's, it's not like sort of testing on more academic topics, right? Um, and we don't have a, a whole lot right now of examples of how to assess for it, how to assess for the competencies of a caregiver or a teacher um, or a mental health provider for that matter, and how do we set, assess children? Um, on this front as well. It's a little bit easier for children, with children, I think. But, um, and I just, I pulled out this quote, um, in terms of an assessment system, you can't move the needle if there is no needle. So starting there, starting with what is our needle, um, and what do we ideally want to achieve, I think is, is an incredibly important first step. So within that, um, coming up with, with clear standards. Um, what are the skills we're talking about children having? Um, and you know, how do those manifest? Um, and again, on the provider or teacher um, or, or mental health clinician side, how are these taught? Um, and on the parent side too, I mean, how are they conveyed? Uh, we've talked a lot about that today. Uh, in terms of um, social emotional development programs, just the more evidence-based programs that can be worked with um, and that providers could be incent incentivized to use, the better. But I think just like curricula in early childhood, folks need a range um, and they, it can't be like a one-size-fits-all type of intervention or program. Um, and there needs to be fidelity to it, but there also needs to be some room to adapt to the particular um, attributes and, and circumstances of a particular child or, or family or provider. Um, obviously, training teachers and educators is a huge, huge piece of this, um, and doing it a way that um, is responsive and going to meet um, educators and, and providers' needs, um, but also what's kind of required of the of the coursework and um, the actual uh, you know uh, education that's that there or training that's needed, um, and then just ongoing um, social emotional development and research because this is just it's again it's not it it is somewhat fluid we know a lot but there's a lot more to learn. Um, and then finally, um, just in terms of our uh, materials, you have some in your packet. Um, the tip sheets we did with uh, Health and Human Services and Ed at the federal level are both for um, parents, but they're also for providers as well. Um, 
We definitely wanted to make sure that providers uh, were getting particular messages that they could use, um, both with children and with families. Um, and then it, both providers and, um, and parents uh, can go to talkingisteaching.org, which is our website and has all of those videos on them and the tip sheets. Um, what we really are about is uh, developing uh, materials and resources that are gonna be helpful to you all uh, and um, that are sort of responsive to, to folks who are working with um, parents of young children and young children themselves uh, and to make it easy to uh, adapt and use in um, the specific settings in, in which you work. So, um, I'm gonna leave it at that. I really appreciate your time. I know this was a long talk with some technical difficulties, but thanks for sticking with me and thanks so much again. Thank you. Thanks, Cara. Thanks very much. Um, we wanna give everyone a chance to uh, ask a few questions or make a comment if you would like to do that. And we have one microphone, so we'll, we'll pass around. Thank you, Cara, for all the work that you do for Too Small to Fail and the other person who also mentioned that they are working with Too Small to Fail. Um, it seems that there's a, a large emphasis on uh, the PSAs, getting parents, <clears throat> understanding, making policies, uh, definitely advancing the youth of tomorrow. Um, I would have to say that like 90, maybe 90% 90 of the teachers that I work with in this community are making between, between 10 and $20 an hour. And in spite of the efforts that we all make to, you know, um, prioritize ongoing education and, uh, um, being really present for the children that they're working with. A lot of these teachers have a lot of stuff going on in their homes that I feel are maybe a trickle down effect from possibly being under recognized or under appreciated by the community at large. So I was wondering if Too Small to Fail is also acknowledging or recognizing or working with um, uh, policymakers to be sure that these these teachers, these providers are having ample opportunities to not only take care of the youth of tomorrow, but themselves. Um, thank you so much for that comment. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more um, about compensation, about um, recognition, about um, really feeling valued um, for what providers do because they do so much. Um, and also the other thing that I think you implied is they have their own things going on. And some of it has directly to do with the fact that they're not recognized and they're not compensated. Um, and yet there is this increasing push towards quality, which I think we all really, really agree with and we need quality. But there is this tension between quality and training and getting better and doing more and not getting compensated or recognized enough. So. First and foremost, I am 100% on the same page um, as you are, and I think any conversation about quality really needs to include a, a parallel conversation about compensation. Um, that, that's sort of personally where I am, but um, I, you know, I think I can speak for the larger institution that I that I work for. Um, too Small to Fail does not specifically do policy work. Um, in the past, the Opportunity Institute has done work sort of on the broader systems that support the parents and caregivers that we um, try to reach through the campaign. Um, so things like paid family leave and mandatory sick days and um, uh, those kinds of policies are things that we've focused on in the past. Um, 
uh, you all have probably heard of Marcy Whitebook from the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment, and um, she's out of UC Berkeley, and she does, an, an, I mean, she just, she's an incredibly brilliant individual who has done so much work on behalf of providers, both in terms of sort of the quality front and education, but also in terms of compensation. Um, and so uh, I would just encourage you, in terms of activating local networks, because um, I think that that's going to be necessary um, to appeal uh, on the compensation front at the state level, to look at, at her research in particular. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Providers are organized. Um, you know, parents believe that providers should should be uh, compensated and recognized. And to I think start in terms of appealing to policymakers to start with the research um, and show just you know how important it is. Uh, and and the fact that folks are leaving the workforce to do other things that you know I think as a society we wouldn't necessarily value as much as caring for our children, but they don't have a choice. Uh, her name is Marcy Whitebook. Um, it's just exactly as it sounds. Um, and she's at the Center for the Study of Child Care Employment out of UC Berkeley. Thank you. I, I think particularly in, with the cost of living in Marin County, we know that 10 to $20 an hour doesn't go very far here. No. We have another uh, question. Absolutely. So this one might be a deep dive too, so just the surface. But sure. Linda Jackson, I'm a trustee on the San Rafael School Board. Yeah. Uh, and my daughter's a nanny, and she says when she goes to the park, often or always, she's the adult on the with the kids, mm -hmm. and the other adults are all looking at their phone. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, we saw, I just came back on a trip and I was in an airport and I was astounded at how quiet the room was as children are sitting quietly and the adults are all on their phone. Yeah. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about the impact that the, the research thinking that is going on at Too Small to Fail about this profound devastating impact on the social emotional development of our children? Thank you. Yeah, this is an incredibly challenging issue, I think, um, for all of us. And, you know, I know that, um, you know, in terms of technology, the AAP, you may know the AAP um, recently came out and said sort of no screens whatsoever for kids 18 months and younger. Um, and then I'm not sure if I'm and they getting got a lot of pushback. Well, yes, there was, well, there's definitely pushback. Um, but then even, you know, beyond that point between, I think, 18 months and three years with an adult, you know, with an adult there. I, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge here, as, as you suggested, is that adults, and I am one of them, I will <laughs> admit this, are, you know, on their devices and technology, um, so much of the time and are, are reliant on it and I think, you know, addicted to it and don't even realize it. And so, you know, this is not intended to be an oversimplification, but really modeling the behavior um, for kids is so incredibly important, especially, you know, when they're young and they are absorbing everything. Um, if their parent or caregiver is, is on a phone or device constantly, they're going to want to do it too because that's really interesting. Um, totally separate from what that content is. Um, you know, I, th I think that uh, in terms of just trying to, to reach parents and caregivers with these messages, we have to be careful because there are lots of positive things that have come from technology and even at sort of older ages, kids can really, um, you know, benefit from technology. There's also been research on the fact that, you know, FaceTiming between a young child and, and a parent um, or caregiver or other adult is actually effective. I mean, that that can, you know, it's not like having an actual human being with you, but it, it can promote the kinds of positive interactions we're having. So, I mean, I think that we need to think more, I think, as sort of a society and within this kind of early childhood development 
group about how we try to get this message across to the adults, um, both in terms of how it affects them, but really how it is rubbing off on the kids. Um, and, you know, I think we need to, to think more about how we get this message across without shaming or blaming, um, but showing that there is an effect on kids um, and that, you know, we all need to get better together about this. Okay, another question here. We'll try to get to everyone. Um, thank you, Linda. It was uh, quite perceptive. Um, I'm just uh, really looking for a, a source here because uh, at the school district, we're dealing with kids that are five and above, uh -huh. and there's a tremendous demand, and we're doing a lot with social emotional development, but yep. the parents want that yep. in the uh, elementary school grades all the way up to just recently, I was confronted by a parent of a high school senior who was just graduating and blamed me for his lack of executive functioning, which I thought was a little bit late to be dealing with that. <laughs> but apparently we should be working on children's executive functioning mm -hmm. all through the schools. I mean, we've heard the term in local parentis, and there's really a demand for that. But where would you steer us to and our teachers, uh, who we do pay more than $20 an hour, to sources for uh, to bring more social emotional development and training and learning into the public schools? Yeah, really, really important question. Um, so we consulted with, uh, in our work with um, HHS and Ed, we um, consulted with a whole body of work that they had already done primarily for Head Start um, on social emotional development. And um, we can, I don't know if this, uh, the list of folks here are available. We can certainly send out links to those. There's, I'm not remembering, there's a, an acronym that um, I'm having trouble remembering, but there's a whole body of work. Um, a lot of that work, uh, Joshua Sparrow, who I mentioned before, who's a child psychiatrist and um, you know works at the Brazelden Touchpoint Center, worked on. Um, there's also a woman out of Vanderbilt University called Mary Louise Hemeter. Um, who has done a lot of really positive work in this area and accessible to parents and providers. So those are two um, sort of main ones. Um, and then, you know, in our white paper, there are definitely uh, various resources. If you look at our white paper and at the references section, there, there are various resources there. Zero to three also has a lot of, um, their uh, sort of parent engagement person is a woman named Claire Lerner. Um, and they have a lot of really, uh, I think, strong materials, uh, both. Zero to three does a lot for, for providers, so. Those and, are kind of three. And the white paper is mentioned on the list of resources. If you would like to not type in that really long string, if you just uh, uh, email me back, I'll send you the resource page electronically, and you can just click on the link. Uh, relative to your uh, comment recently, the statistics that, that are available today uh, show that the learning ability of children and particularly from, say, the uh, junior years, or I should say the earlier years, as far as cell phones are concerned, are terribly negative and also uh, absolutely impair their ability to learn and concentrate in the class, in the school, and outside. And I have seen this as a volunteer in the schools, and I've seen it with my own grandchildren who drive me crazy with texting. And I've said, you know, I don't text. If you want to talk to me and I want to talk to you, we will speak on the phone or we will not speak. But seeing it in the classroom and seeing them come out of the class, and as they walk out of the class, they're accessing their cell phones and they could be talking to the person in the other side of the, the classroom or another part of the school. And the amount of time that they're putting and energy that is going into this is so deleterious. 
for their overall behavior, and it absolutely, there's no two ways about it, is that they have, it, it can be identified with any other type of drug or alcoholism or anything else, is a tremendous dependence on this. And seeing it in the schools and seeing what they are doing with it and how it's affecting them is terrible. And the thing that I, I have grappled with, isn't there some way to collect all of the cell phones in the classroom, which I have seen done occasionally, and remove the cell phones and they cannot take their cell phones back till they leave the class and or collect all of the cell phones at the beginning of the school session and let them to, uh, allow them, because then they would develop communication skills, they would have eye-to-eye -eye contact, they would have all of the things that we need, you know, as far as, as growth is concerned in school. So I think you're, you've got a major problem, and it's, it's addiction. There's no two ways about it. And, the one resource that um, I would imagine a number of you are familiar with is uh, Common Sense Media. Uh, Jim Steyer is actually on our board um, of Too Small to Fail um, and has been a big supporter. And um, you know, I think in terms of, of kids um, and their media use, it's a, it's a really great resource. I guess the, the one thing I, I will say is while, um, I mean, I have two teenage girls as well, I, I feel your pain, um, but is, you know, Again, I said this before, if you look around you, whether it's an adolescent or, you know, an adult, um, you know, a, a 20 year old or a 30 year old or even a, you know, older, lots and lots of people are just completely, you know, sort of glued to their phones. And that's what kids are seeing too. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm not casting blame on the adults, um, but I do think that they, they see that around them a lot in their homes and just you know from peers, but also from adults. There's another question. I have oh. a question. Um, oh, sorry. We are entering. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We are entering into this. I guess we already enter into this generation of technology, where you can see phones being given to little children yeah. to just calm them down. Yeah because it makes them quiet, because they're not running around, and they're not crying. So every time a child cries, and I'm talking about two years old with little fingers, yeah. know how to flip, turn on, turn yeah. off, go to games on an iPhone yeah. or any smartphone. Um, I, I conduct uh, play groups in the community, and I see many, many parents giving that to the children. Mm -hmm. But because I talked to them about it, we had an orientation and talk about it, uh, and then they enter into the playgroup with no phones. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure that as soon as they leave, right. they go to the vendor machine right, and they give them the phone. So it's sweets in their phones. Yeah. Um, and I would like to know, this is a question for you, yeah. what is the best way to deliver this new information, this research to parents about social and emotional when they're trying at home, but it's very hard to control this um, new wave of technology where there's a lot of violence, where cartoons that you see on TV now mm -hmm. is, is not like, like Tom and Jerry. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like that, but bad. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know what else to do mm -hmm. to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, this is something that is so incredibly challenging and it's like a, a conundrum um, in terms of, of how to manage it. Um, you know, I think one thing honestly is the research that I talked about um, and that, you know, we, we know that exists is based on direct human interaction between a 
two human beings, like a, a child or a baby and a parent or caregiver. Um, and to say that nothing really can replace that, um, and particularly in the earliest years, to be responsive to the child's needs, to engage with them in back and forth interactions, um, to be to show affection, um, to uh, be nurturing. Those are the things that really promote the child's brain development and social emotional development. Those are the things that eventually, um, and not so soon after, make children uh, more likely to, to learn academically um, and more able to engage. They make children more able to sort of understand their own feelings. They make children more able to go and do things independently on their own, knowing that they can come back to somebody who's going to meet their needs if they need it. Um, so just to, to really emphasize the fact that it's that human interaction um, and it's that responsiveness and that's it's that back and forth that makes the difference and, and nothing else can really replace that. And there are lots and lots and lots of things that parents can do um, to try to engage their children other than giving, you know, a, a phone or turning the TV on or, or whatever it is. Um, and to practice that in these groups, to practice, because some, some parents don't know quite what that looks like, um, or they're embarrassed to do it in public, or, you know, they're, they're it, and some people just don't have the information. Um, so it's really a combination, I think, of, of all of those things, the research, modeling the behavior, and then just kind of the information distilled down kind of from the research about what makes a difference. Other questions? Hi, thanks so much for all of the information you, you gave us today. Sure. Um, my question is about teen parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the things that you presented, I would see are, are great ways of, of um, dealing with little kids as adults. Yep. But um, in being a high school educator for the past 23 years, um, the teen parents, they don't want to talk, read, and sing to their kids. Mm -hmm. They think that, I mean, one of my most recent um, experiences with a teen mom is that she thinks her baby is annoying. Mm -hmm. It went from, as, an, as a newborn and an infant, she, the mom did amazing. She took very, very good care. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as those, the baby starts growing up, and um, so when you talk about you know, the talk, read, sing, and engaging ways, um, all of these things are extremely complex for teen parents. Yep. And so I'm wondering what is happening with the Too Small to Fail um, uh, project in engaging teen parents um, and it being cool. Because I love yeah. your videos. I mean, I'm a mom and, and I love your videos, but I was a mom at 37 for, as yeah. my first child was born. So yeah. that stuff all works for me. But a teenager will not engage with those types of videos. Yep. Um, they are attached to their cell phones. So although I don't want them to be, that's our reality. Yep. So how are we going to use that in a way that can really help the teenagers? Such an important question. And, you know, it's like they're still growing and going through their own developmental um, changes and, and transition. I mean, we all always are. But particularly as adolescents, um, it is a challenging time. So uh, a couple of different things. I mean, one, um, you know, to the extent that you think this would be, uh, you know, interesting, I mean, we have some uh, short PSAs that have actresses like Hollywood moms um, engaging in this stuff. So that's number one. Uh, the other is that we don't have them on our website. I think that we can probably share the the clips from Jane the Virgin. I mean, I, I realize this is a little bit of a contradiction. We just talked about how we don't want to, you know, put put ourselves or or children in front of technology, but. Teenagers are, as you said, you know, very interested in technology and very influenced by technology. So the second is just 
having them look at some of those clips um, and or watch you know, some of those shows um, because they do do integrations. The third along those lines is there's a show called East Close High um, that Zero to Three, and if you go to the Zero to Three website, um, it does, uh, and basically it's based on a teen mom um, at a high school, and it was originally developed to reduce levels of teen pregnancy, um, but it they've done some really interesting stuff um, with the main character of the show, just sort of doing little, I mean, there's kind of like mini, I want to call them webisodes, um, where she's just talking straight to the camera. She has kind of Cheerios plastered all over her. She's, um, you know, really fed up. She's, I think, 16 or 17. And she just talks about how hard it is um, and kind of what keeps her going. Uh, and then I guess that, you know, if there are other kind of like popular folks um, who they admire or relate to who are parents, um, whether it's like Christy T and John Legend or whatever who can be inspirational. I think using sort of popular media for these purposes can, or a YouTuber can be really, really helpful. Um, but it is a whole area that is, um, you know, incredibly important. Um, I think the National, and I'm going to get the name wrong, but the National Association of Preventing Pregnancy in, in, at the federal level has done a lot of other kind of like entertainment oriented, um, you know, uh, work on this as well. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. But you're talking about the intervention. The teenagers are having babies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. You know, most recently a 14 year old, she's about to give birth in two weeks. Yep. And, and it's just like, what in the world is she supposed to do with this child? Yep. Um, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm excited to see things start unfolding when people, I mean, the prevention has to be there, but then I think there has to be some movement towards, well, this is happening. Yeah. We can't look away from it because yeah. it's happening. It's been happening for a long, long time, but yeah. I'm actually seeing services go away a little bit more than I am seeing them increase. Yeah. Um, in the last 15 years, 10, 15 years, it seems like there's not as much happening for teenagers in mm -hmm. helping them mm -hmm. in what to do once they have the baby because yep. there's so much focus on prevention, yep. which, again, I agree with. But, well, um, and it's been effective And it's overall. been effective overall, but right. then we, we have a whole nother side to really grapple with. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, as you said, it's looking who are their role models in popular culture and can they tap into that? So, and that's part of our job too, you know what I mean? To find those folks and have them be spokespeople. Thank you. Any other questions? One more and then we'll try to get everyone on their way. Hi, um, I was just wondering about your tip sheets and the tools that you've created, how you're um, measuring their impact and, and what feedback you're having about them. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. So um, for our tip sheets and our videos, uh, we did a really intentional push through social media to, to get them out. Um, and uh, we have gotten encouraging responses. I mean, we have now, I think, over 80,000 hits on the, on the videos themselves. Um, and then we also have very encouraging sort of um, uh, sort of uh, read times on um, the tip sheets where people are spending around an average of four minutes or so reading through the tip sheets, which is also encouraging. Um, and uh, the same is true um, about, I think, like two and a half minutes on each of the videos. So we're looking at those kinds of, you know, electronic media metrics. Uh, but we are also in the process of, and actually I can sort of put this out there, but in a similar way that we've worked with Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland and Zuckerberg San Francisco General um, and other clinics um, in different parts of, of California and even the country um, to share our early literacy and early math um, materials through pediatricians and then also, like I said, through faith-based leaders and librarians, um, you know, throughout communities. We are planning to partner with a clinic 
um, a pediatric primary care, probably federally qualified, um, so serving mostly Medicaid families, uh, clinic to have their pediatricians pilot the, the videos with parents in the well baby visit. Um, so that you know they can they have a way. We've heard from from pediatric primary care providers that it's not always easy to talk about social emotional development. You don't really know where a parent's coming from, and using the medium of a video can actually really kind of like you know bridge that um, that divide. So we are planning on working with a clinic and working with pediatricians as the trusted messengers specifically around social emotional development as well and measuring that. Um, but we also have done a fair amount of, um, of evaluation and research on our early literacy and early math materials um, and the evaluation of social emotional development would probably mimic that and those are on our website as well. And First Five Marin and the Marin Communications Forum um, will be sharing the videos on the Facebook pages. So if you want to share that from your organization, um, if you'll just look for that later today, I'll post the, the videos individually and then you can um, share what you'll like, provide the link also so you can direct people uh, to the website. Um, and then also Common Sense Media was uh, mentioned and just wanted to let you know there's obviously so much to deal with on phones and technology and, and how that affects children and families. So we'll be, um, we're talking with them about doing a, a whole session like this um, coming up in 2018. So any other questions before we go? Thanks again to Cara Dukakis Thank from you. Too Small to Fail. Thank you so much. Thank you.